Welcome to the AVI Network's Best Practices for the Load Balancing as a Service in OpenStack webinar. A couple of uh, logistical items. Uh, during the webinar, if you have any questions, you can uh, go to the GoToWebinar panel and uh, post your questions in the Q&A panel, and we will address them uh, at the end of the webinar. I will spend about 10, 15 minutes on the slides. We'll do a live demo, then we'll recap, and then um, uh, around half an hour, 35 minutes mark, we'll start the Q&A. So um, let's get started. Again, my contact information is down here, so if you have any questions after the webinar, uh, feel free to uh, contact me. So as you might have already noticed, especially if you're an OpenStack practitioner, um, OpenStack has been growing in popularity, especially for enterprise private clouds. Uh, you had Visa, you had Volkswagen more recently, Time Warner Cable, Walmart, and many other enterprise companies deploying OpenStack in their private cloud environment. And so you might think that that's all great, right? Um, you have OpenStack as now an alternative to deploying your private clouds. It should be fairly easy to get started and uh, um, deploy your production workloads. However, uh, in reality, if you look at some of the recent user surveys uh, coming out of the OpenStack Summit and outside of that, there are a couple of key challenges that are still existing in terms of uh, deploying production applications in OpenStack. One such survey uh, last fall called out performance and security are uh, among the top two concerns for uh, wide, wider spread adoption of OpenStack. A more recent article uh, from Tech Target talked about why uh, some of the reasons that uh, OpenStack adoption is lagging is because of some of the mis missing functions, um, such as network reliability, scalability, and load balancing. So you might wonder, well, open OpenStack is a collection of uh, open source components. Why are performance, scalability, and load balancing so hard? Well, if you want to summarize that, you can say it's a choice between open source solutions and traditional load balancers, especially if you're talking about load balancing and performance and scalability. On the one hand, you have the open source solutions such as HA Proxy that are integrated with um, the OpenStack distributions. So that's a plus point. You get to get started very, very easily. However, um, when you're planning to deploy your production workloads into OpenStack, you need those enterprise grade features that you've been used to, whether it's SSL offload, whether it's load layer seven policies, uh, application monitoring and analytics, and um, the elastic scale and flexibility that you expect from a public cloud like AWS, you want to use that in OpenStack. That's the reason why you're deploying a cloud environment. So the, the open source solutions that are built into OpenStack lack some of these key capabilities that make them ready for your production deployment. Well, then you might wonder, well, you've been used to um, the legacy hardware appliances in, uh, um, in your uh, traditional data center environment. Can't we just use uh, those for your OpenStack uh, private cloud? They, after all, come, back, come with enterprise grade features. Well, that's true. They do have the enterprise grade features. However, they are complex to integrate and manage. They are not built for the elastic private cloud that the whole OpenStack is about, right? They're inflexible, they're expensive, and again, they also do not have the visibility and analytics that you need when you're deploying your um, production mission critical applications in OpenStack. So you have a choice between a DIY with open source or if I were to use an analogy, I'm applying a mainframe solution to an elastic cloud with the legacy solutions. Clearly, it's not gonna work. They were not built for this environment. They lack the agility and flexibility. So let's take a step back and say, well, what do you need for production OpenStack deployment? How do you uh, mirror the capabilities um, of a dynamic cloud uh, deployment that you want to achieve? So there are some core principles that you need to have when you want to deploy in your OpenStack uh, environment. These are software-defined principles. Um, and what I mean by that is you need a software-only solution that runs on commodity x86. Naturally, if you want cloud, you don't want to be both anchored by a, a legacy hardware appliance solution. You want it to be infrastructure independent. What do I mean by that? Well, you might deploy certain applications within OpenStack that are on VMs, on a KVM, for example. You might uh, deploy applications on a bare metal. Well, you might also have a container deployment that you want to be incorporated as part of your OpenStack cloud. And you might have certain workload running in public cloud, like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud Engine. You want to make sure that whatever solution you deploy can, and can support this multi-hypervisor, 
multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environment. Next is self-service and programmability. You want a 100% API-based solution so that you can provide the self-service IT, the holy grail of uh, private cloud, where you don't want to have tickets based um, a change where you don't, wait, you don't want to wait for weeks to get a change uh, propagated. You want a built-in multi-tenancy that integrates with Horizon, uh, that hor uh, integrates with Keystone, for that matter, so that individual business units or customers, whether it's a private cloud or public cloud, can self-service themselves. And then you need 100% automation, again, tied to the, the previous two points. So those are your software-defined principles. However, you want to combine these with the um, enterprise-grade application services features. Notice the word application services. I'm not using load balancing only. You want to think about services beyond load balancing. Of course, you need L7 load balancing capabilities, SSL offload and security, but you need visibility, you need analytics, you need the ability to automatically scale based on real-time performance of the application and the user demand. That's where I talk about enterprise-grade application services. So what you need for your uh, deployment in your OpenStack environment is a combination of software-defined principles with enterprise-grade application services. Let's segue uh, for a minute into how one search solution might look like. So we here at Adi Networks has built this uh, enterprise-grade web scale application services fabric. How did we do that? So if you look at the current, the picture that I'm showing you here right now, if you look at any legacy in a network deployment environment, you have a racks of servers, some of them running bare metal workloads, some of them were running virtualized workloads. And in a legacy environment, you have a pair, an active standby pair of appliances, load balancing appliances. What we did that, we looked at this load balancing appliance and said, let's separate the control plane from the data plane. So if you look at the software-defined principles, where you have a centralized control plane and a distributed data plane, that's exactly what we did. The distributed data plane, we call them service engines, um, can run on a bare metal server, can run on uh, as a virtual machine on a KVM or any other hypervisor. It can also run as containers, or it can also run in a public cloud environment, simultaneously being managed by centralized AVI controller. So you've got a centralized control plane, a distributed data plane that's multi-hypervisor, multi-environment. Additionally, in, uh, in addition to doing the load balancing, the service engine also act as distributed network probes. So without any agents, without any span ports or monitoring fabrics, as the service engine, which are the load balancer, sit strategically in line with the traffic and look at every packet that's going through, they're collecting hundreds of metrics and logs every second, pushing it up to the AVI controller, which is running a big data analytics engine and gives you the visibility and a centralized dashboard for what's going on. So this is the architecture that is built on those software-defined principles while providing enterprise-grade application services, the founding uh, principles of what you want to deploy in an OpenStack environment. So with that introduction, let's segue back to our OpenStack discussion and say, well, how we, you might deploy such a solution in OpenStack, a solution that is a drop-in replacement for HA proxy. So it's natively integrated with various OpenStack services such as NOAA, Neutron, Keystone, Horizon, and LBAS, while providing the enterprise grade load balancing and application monitoring and security services. So um, what you see here is an AVI controller that's deployed as a cluster of NOVA instances. Remember, these are NOVA instances. It's run on OpenStack. They are not setting appliances outside. Okay. You deploy AVI controller as NOVA instances, and then you have two ways to configure uh, load balancing and other policies. You can use the LBAS APIs. However, as many of our customers do, because LBAS is a very restrictive set of uh, features, um, not even SSL in the LBAS v1, for example, um, many customers use REST API into AVI directly. And as we'll see in the demo, we've integrated AVI's UI directly into Horizon. Right? So there are two ways to come in and provision uh, load balancing policies. Well, when you log into the AVI controller, either through um, REST APIs or if you're using um, Horizon, um, AVI controller talks to Keystone for importing tenants, users, and role information. So you don't need to define separate set of policies and, and users and roles. It just uses Keystone information. And based on the tenancy, then it talks to Nova and spins up these service engines 
which are again Nova instances. You can spin up these um, service engine as Nova instances within the tenant context, as I'm showing here, as dedicated for each tenant, or you can have a shared services model where you have these service engines shared across multiple tenants. Once these um, service engines are spun up, automatically, by the way, by Avi controller, it then talks to Neutron to plumb them in the right network to make sure that when it configures the load balancing policies, it can talk to the pool of servers, it can configure VIP appropriately, all of the network plumbing is done automatically. And then as the traffic grows or uh, shrinks or as you deploy more tenants or more uh, workloads, uh, it talks to Nova again to spin up additional resources on demand, just like Amazon ELB. And finally, with the Horizon integration, you can see the application performance, the monitoring and the analytics information directly into Horizon. You don't need to code another dashboard. So as you can see here, Avi has done um, a native integration with OpenStack services such, such that it automates the spin up, the plumbing, the provisioning, and the scale and high availability of the distributed load balancers. All right, it's a perfect time to segue into the demo and see some of these principles um, in live action. So, for the demo purposes, this is my topology. I have an admin tenant, or I call a provider tenant, where I have deployed the Avi controller and Avi service engines. In this mode, these are shared across um, a different tenants. Uh, as I said earlier in my previous slide, you can also have Avi service engines dedicated per tenant. Again, it's a simple setting in Avi. And I have two tenants uh, running a set of application uh, VMs, which I want to load balance. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, let's go to the browser where I am um, going to show you um, the layout first. So as you can see here, I'm logged into Horizon and I'm in the admin tenant, and I have a couple of other tenants here. In the admin tenant, I see, I show, I'm showing you the network topology. So I have an AVI controller. I, in this case, it's a demo environment, so I have a single instance. In a production environment, you'll have three uh, VMs as a cluster. I also have a couple of um, uh, service engines as Nova instances. And you notice that on one of these service engines, I have more than one interface, and that's because it's providing load balancing as a service to multiple tenants and multiple networks. You can actually see that in the compute instance tab here, um, uh, that these controllers and service engines are, again, Nova instances, and in this case, one of the service engines is in multiple networks, again, because it's serving multiple different tenants. Now let's go to the tenant that I want to show you the, where the load balancing is deployed. Uh, and if I look at the network topology here, and what you will see is that here I have a couple of application servers, a um, couple of servers here, I have another server and a client. And they are accessing the uh, uh services through, uh, um, uh, that, that are running in the admin tenant. So let's look at the load balancer interface. And what you will notice here is Actually, we have um, incorporated the horizon, the UI directly into Horizon, right? Um, and that's because most of the customers have told us that I don't want to use L native LBAS APIs. I want to use Avi UI because it's much more flexible and so on. However, you might ask, well, I'm not interested in using Avi UI directly. I would like to use um, the built-in uh, interface. Not a problem. Let's go into another Horizon integration that we have. Again, the same controller, different Horizon dashboard. <clears throat> and in this case, um, I have uh, the integration that I have done is in such a way that you still have your pool, your members, and a monitor interface that you're used to. But in addition, we have added SSL certificate management and analytics dashboard, which is exactly this, which is what you just saw. So you have two ways to integrate into um, Horizon. You can have the classic LBAS interface, where you can use your pools, members, and monitors, and spin up your load balancers this way, and then use the analytics tab to just see what's going on. Or, as I showed earlier, you can do full-fledged integration, where you can just create a virtual service with a couple of clicks, and um, you can get going. All right, again, very seamless integration into Horizon. And, if I, and, and, and by the way, it's fully multi-tenant. So uh, if I'm interested in log, logging into another tenant, which might have a different set of uh, load balancers, the, the controller is uh, uh, multi-tenant, the data plane is multi-tenant, and you can actually see that on a different tenant, I have two different load balancers, unlike the, the three load balancers I showed in the other tenant. Again, natively multi-tenant. 
All right, let's switch gear in terms of the demo and show some of the analytics and scaling capabilities. So for that one, I'm going to use um, a different uh, a different uh, uh, dashboard here. I'm going to use some of the AVI dashboard where you have a more applications running. First thing you notice is it's an unlike an, a load balancing dashboard. It is an application monitoring and analytics dashboard uh, where you can see a color-coded health score of various applications. I have about a couple of dozen applications running here, and the color indicates the health of the application. So for example, if this is red, um, let's see what the health score consists of. So for Avi, the application health score consists of performance, which means how the, what the throughput is, what the latency is, uh, if there's any HTTP errors, for example, it is reflected in the performance score of the application. There are a couple of other penalties that we measure. There's a resource penalty, which is measuring the utilization of uh, uh, the infrastructure, so load balancing infrastructure, application infrastructure, and so on. And if we, re if, if, we if we identify that there is a uh, CPU, memory, or any of the resources running hot, then we call that out as a penalty. And if you have auto scale policies configured, you can use some of these metrics to automatically scale out the infrastructure. Uh, the anomaly penalty measures the uh, abnormal behavior in your application performance. So if there is a sudden spike in latency or sudden drop in throughput uh, compared to the baseline performance, we call that out as an anomaly penalty. And then a security penalty measures security misconfiguration, DDoS attack that might be going on, and so on. So let's put that in perspective around our OpenStack discussion. When you deploy your application into OpenStack environment, you want that peace of mind. Remember, you were going from a dedicated infrastructure to a shared private cloud and you had certain application SLAs to guarantee. This monitoring and performance uh, uh, analytics guarantees uh, that you never lose uh, a view on how your applications are doing. Let's actually um, see a couple of more uh, visual representations of my application performance and the deployment. So now I move from a list view to a tree view of my application. And what this tells you is how my applications deploy. So for example, if I look at the demo application, uh, it's running on this specific load balancer. This is the service engine that it's running on, which is healthy. The application itself is moderate healthy uh, because of the performance issues. And I'm content switching across five different pools. Again, what you're used to from an enterprise grade load balancer. I have L7 policies that dictate which pool of servers I'm load balancing across, which network these servers are are present in and what the health of the server is. For example, this server is running uh, low on performance and this particular server actually is unreachable because ARP is unresolved. See how powerful it is to understand your infrastructure health, health um, as it pertains to the application. You're not monitoring a VM for the sake of monitoring. You are monitoring the application performance and all its constituents in terms of the network, the, the backend servers, throughput, the latency, et cetera. And on the same note, let's actually dig a little deeper into um, the application health and performance monitoring. So I've logged into one of the, I've logged, uh, clicked into one of the application dashboards. We call this application demo AVI. And what you see here, in addition to the health score we just what discussed, um, are an end-to-end -end timing diagram. This calls out that over the last six hours, my end-to-end -end latency from my clients, which might be accessing this application from the internet, so in this case, over a WAN. The latency from the clients, mobile users, your laptops, computers, et cetera, is about 112 milliseconds into the data center, right? So that's, that's the WAN latency. The local network latency within the data center is about a millisecond and a half. This is the network latency between the load balancer and the backend servers. The application is taking just about 83, 84 milliseconds to process the request. This is application processing time separate from network latency. And finally, just about 0.3 milliseconds for the data to go back with the end-to-end -end user experience of 197.9 milliseconds on an average. This is a phenomenal tool for troubleshooting, for visibility, and most, as most of our customers call it, mean time to innocence. Why is, it, why is that term? Well, because as you probably know, as a network admin, you get blamed for every performance problems of an application. Application slow, it must be a network problem. It must be the load balancer. Something is screwed up there. And normally what happens is you get finger pointing going on between different teams, server team, app team, network team, and so on. 
Well, this dashboard tells you first if there is a problem, and second, if the problem exists, where it might exist. And as you can, you can actually look around this timeline, it's like the network DVR, where you can see the latencies at different times of the, uh, of the day, in this case, or six hours. And you can change this to be real time, week, month, year, whatever time frame that you're looking at. So again, a very powerful end-to-end uh, -end latency breakdown tool. Now, okay, you say this is all good. This is all a summary view of the last six hours. What about individual mon uh, transactions monitoring? Can you, can you give uh, visibility to individual transactions? Absolutely. So by default, we propagate only significant logs, but let's say I'm interested in all the TCP and HTTP logs in my system over the last six hours. There you go. Controller is pulling all this data from the service engines as we speak, and you can see here that over the last six hours, about 28,000 or so logs, and still building up a few of them. There you go. And now you can use a Google-like search to log, go through your logs. Again, putting it back to your OpenStack private cloud. Once you deploy application and you load balance in there, do you know if it's going well? If somebody complains that I want to know what the experience from an iPhone is, well, you just search for an iPhone, you have all the iPhone logs only. So for example, if I go by one of them, it says that this particular transaction came from Canada, running on iOS, naturally, we're running, talking about iPhones here, TLS 1.1 um, uh, SSL version with RSS certificate at this timestamp. It took 56 milliseconds for this particular transaction to hit the load balancer from Canada, not bad. Um, it was served by this WIP, naturally, that's our uh, load balancer, uh, at this timestamp. And uh, it, the backend connection was this IP port, again, you don't need to do TCP dumps. Uh, the backend connection took one millisecond round trip on the network. The application was extremely fast, negligible time to respond, um, and the data transfer was very fast with the end to end experience of 57 milliseconds. And this transaction was looking for um, homepage or a slash, right? So this way you can look for every needing the haystack kind of analytics. Um, you, and, and then we have a whole set of log analytics that's built in here, so you can say, um, across over the last six hours, over 41,000 logs, what are the different browsers which are um, coming into Avi? Well, you can say that it's primarily Safari, over 42%. Uh, which devices are my customers using? You get a breakdown. What's the end-to-end -end breakdown of my latency? And what you see here is that a, a bar chart of uh, a different latency uh, uh, of my uh, transactions. You will notice that but three quarters of them are 100, under 100 milliseconds. But there are a few which are on a very high end of this latency. So as a network admin, you want to know what, what's going on. Well, let's click at one of these um, ranges. And if I click on that, my query got populated with, um, with that search. And now what I have is um, only the transactions, about 3,000 of those, which, are, which have very high latency. And you can then say, well, is it a specific browser that's slow? No. Is it a specific OS that might be slow? Doesn't look like. Is it a specific location that might be slow? Well, it looks like, yes, almost all are coming from India, and there is one off from South Africa. So let's ignore that as an exception. Let's look at all the transactions from India. And then you can open up one of them and see what's going on. You can see that there are very high client RTT, over 800 milliseconds of van latency. And you can even visually see that as I hover my mouse around, you can see the color-coded breakdown of my latency chart. And the yellow is for the client RTT. So clearly, I have a problem on my WAN side. And with a couple of clicks, I'm able to figure out that this high latency is all um, limited to the transactions coming from India. And now I can go to my WAN team and troubleshoot the problem. An extremely powerful troubleshooting tool. You can do other... Um, uh, other things like uh, see if there are any errors. For example, I see a 404 here. So I click on that, I see only the logs with 404s. Naturally, 404 means a missing file or a missing link. So let's look at what URIs are uh, generating 404s. Well, it looks like there are a couple of furious ones, but the main one is a PNG file. So let, let's look at just that. And then you have a pool of four servers that you're load balancing. Let's see which of the servers the, the, this file is missing. Clearly, two out of four servers, this file is missing. You troubleshoot the application problem. Again, from a load balancer that's running, that's sitting in line, you're able to also do application performance monitoring, troubleshooting, and a quick triage. 
extremely important as far as your um, OpenStack deployment goes. All right, so you might say um, we've done a great job in terms of uh, identifying the performance issues, et cetera. What about security? You mentioned SSL. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, uh, what, what we do about SSL? Absolutely. So I'm going to show you our security dashboard. Um, as, as we do full high-speed, high-performance SSL offload uh, with uh, both RSA and EC certificates, we support PFS, we do DDoS mitigation. What you see on the screen here, for example, is our SSL insights. So on the left-hand side, you have an SSL certificate breakdown. What you see is that about 88% of the clients are using RSA sorts with perfect forward secrecy. About 12% are using uh, elliptic curve. You can also see the breakdown of TLS version, 70% are 1.0, 30% are 1.1. And how is this important? Well, tomorrow if there is a attack similar to Poodle attack um, on your, um, that, that was on SSL v3, a similar attack is discovered on v, uh, TLS v1.0, and you say, let me disable v1, well, you need to know what the impact is on your um, applications. Right there, you know that about 70% of your clients are using TLS 1.1. Also, uh, we give an SSL score, which measures the cipher strength, the York security policies, uh, certificate expiry time, whether you have a trusted certificate or not, et cetera. Again, um, a comprehensive set of SSL capabilities built in to our Vantage platform. Finally, if there are any DDoS attack that might be going on, we attack, for example, there's some L4 attacks going on, L7 attacks going on, and with a single click, you can go ahead and even uh, block these uh, DDoS attacks. So for example, on this screen, uh, it's gonna show you what are the different attack types uh, that, that are going through right now, as soon as my uh, uh, dashboard uh, uh, populates, and then you can go to which top URL, which ASN, uh, and with a single click, for example, I can say block the attack. So at this point, you are saving your applications from getting uh, attacked by DDoS. All right, so that takes care of your, some of the security things that we do. Um, let me wrap up the demo with one last thing, which is the scalability. Remember, we started this uh, presentation um, saying that you need uh, the elastic scale and the agility and the flexibility that a cloud offers. So let's see what we have here. So um, right now I have this application. The dashboard is similar to what you have uh, seen in the past. Um, I'm running uh, at the end-to-end -end latency for about 84 milliseconds. Uh, and as soon as uh, this dashboard updates, I'm going to show that the performance is about 250 megabits per second or so. All right. Um, but if I look at the score, the health, you will notice that uh, I have two penalties. One is a security penalty. We saw that earlier. That's because of the um, certificate not being trusted. But there is a resource penalty. And the resource penalty is coming from um, uh, the CPU utilization. Let's actually look at that. So if you look at the resource penalty, you see that the, my service engine, my load balancer is running at 100% CPU. Now, naturally, you won't do that in a production. This is a demo environment where I have disabled auto scale capabilities because I want to show how easy it is to scale, right? So let me go back to, the, um, to this dashboard and show you here that I have one service engine, um, which means one load balancer handling this application. With a simple click, or with an API, of course, or in automated fashion, if you have auto scale enabled, you click on um, scale out. And if I click on scale out, what happens is the AVI controller talks to the orchestration system uh, with Nova, for example, in case of OpenStack, spins up an additional service engine, uh, puts the service engines in the right network, provisions the load balancing policies, and within a few seconds, you will see that the traffic that was running at 250 uh, megabits per second will jump and almost double into the 500, millisecond, 500 megabits per second range. So now, instead of running one load balancer, I'm running two. So single application is being serviced by two load balancers. And, and you will see in, as the uh, data refreshes, and as I was speaking, the traffic shot up from uh, about 250, 270 me megabits per second to close to uh, 450. It'll go up to about 500 megabits per second. So this level of flexibility and agility, you cannot achieve with legacy appliances or even with the open source solution. Imagine where you have hardware appliances or even software appliances uh, where you're bound by the capacity of the appliance and you will automatically scale on a Black Friday or a Cyber Monday. Imagine doing that, that with appliances. You cannot, right? That's, that's the advantage of what Avi brings. All right, so with that, um, uh, let's go back and wrap up the presentation, and then we'll open up for Q&A. 
before I summarize the presentation, let me actually uh, spend a minute on our uh, case study. So uh, one of the largest U.S. cable companies uh, in, uh, has deployed Avi in their OpenStack private cloud. And this picture uh, mimics their deployment model. So what they have is Avi controller integrated with Horizon, and the cloud team uh, or the IT team uses Avi UI directly to uh, provision and define policies. Uh, so they define policies such that uh, these tenants can use this SLAs or they can use this type of HA or they can have load balancers with this flavor of uh, open uh, Nova VMs and a second tenant might have a different type of SLA and so on. And then individual business units, a line of business and the users log into the Horizon dashboard through Keystone credentials, look at the AVI uh, 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 UI that's integrated into Horizon that we just saw and spin up their own load balancers, troubleshoot their own applications, scale out automatically without opening up a ticket. So the cloud team, the IT team, defines the policies, controls what the tenants can do, but the tenants don't have to open up the tickets to actually provision their load balancers. All right, so what did we see in this, uh, the best practices uh, uh, discussion today? What we saw that in order to have uh, production applications deployed in your OpenStack environment, you need an enterprise grade load balancing solution, enterprise grade application services solutions, that's software that's distributed, that's multi-tenant, and that's managed by centralized control so that it can automate. You need a solution that's natively integrated with the OpenStack services so that the, the deployment, the provisioning, the HA, the, the configuration, et cetera, is completely automated. You need a solution that's 100% REST API so that it can automate the, the entire uh, uh, deployment model. You want a solution that offers the self-service provisioning to the tenants and provides isolation, provides different SLAs whether in terms of dedicated or shared, what's control plane isolation and data plane isolation. And finally, you need a solution that can scale automatically, elastically, so you can bring the benefits of Amazon ELB, for example, into your OpenStack private cloud. So with that, we're ready to take questions. Um, before I do that, I must plug in, uh, we will be at the OpenStack Summit in Austin, end of the month uh, at Boot C24. Come on and uh, talk to us, talk to some of our customers who will be present there. Um, you can also try OpenStack in your environment. Just go to avinetworks.com slash try, download, play with it. It's free for you to use in dev test, and the first six months are free in any case. And then if you need more information, go to avinetworks.com slash OpenStack, where we'll talk where there's a video and the case study that we just talked about at the cable company um, using Avi, and then you can also find more collateral. Grant, um, any questions that we yes. have? Yes, <clears throat> we do have a few questions coming in from the audience. So first off, um, we have one gentleman who wants to know if we support LBAS V2. Um, excellent question. So yes, the LBAS V2 support is coming in next quarter or so. Um, however, you note that if you, if you, if you see the, um, uh, what you saw in terms of uh, horizon integration, LBAS V1, but even in LBAS V2's case, the uh, features that that are supported by Elbaz V2 are still limited. It doesn't support L7 policies. Uh, it is still a limited set of capabilities. So yes, we will support Elbaz V2, but most of customers would prefer to uh, use the Horizon integration directly. So we, we, you, you have a choice. Got it, thank you. Um, next question is, can we support hybrid cloud? Oh, absolutely. So um, as I showed in one of my slides, we can support on-premises, and public clouds. You can simultaneously from a single AVI controller have application uh, being load balanced uh, in private cloud, whether it's OpenStack, a VMware, a container environment, and AWS, where we spin up these service engines dynamically in the right environment. Excellent. Um, next question is, what specific requirements do you have from Neutron? Uh, for example, do, do we allow um, address, address pairs extension support? Right. So. So, the, 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 so let me answer the direct question first and then I'll have a broader answer. So yes, uh, from Neutron, all we require is allowed address pair extension and ability to uh, do floating IP with this allowed address pair. Um, and we can go into technical details as to why, but other than that, uh, we don't need anything else. And we don't really care about the, the SDN solution that you might be using. So we do integrate with Cisco ACI, Nuage, and some of the other um, solutions. Um, that's because uh, the service engines are running in user space. So they are running as VMs. So by the time the traffic comes to Avi um, service engines, they have been untagged. 
So other than allowed address pair extensions and a floating IP support for um, that allowed address pair uh, IPs, you, you, there are no other uh, Neutron requirements. Got it. Looks like we have one more question here about SSL performance. And mm -hmm. How is um, Avi's SSL performance as a software load balancer? That's an excellent question, and thank you for asking that, because that's a big myth that you need hardware acceleration for SSL. In fact, on a price performance basis, uh, Avi's SSL performance for, for a dollar or for a thousand dollars for that matter will be about 25 to 30 X to that of uh, legacy load balancers. And that's because Intel has done a tremendous progress in terms of uh, supporting SSL, especially the elliptic curve cryptography on um, Intel x86 processors. So we can, for example, run 2000 to 2500 SSL TPS on a single vCPU core. So if you want, for example, um, um, uh, let's say you want uh, 50,000 TPS uh, support, sure, no problem. Just deploy us on 20 vCPUs or 25 vCPUs, and you've got uh, uh, 50,000 TPS. If you compare that to legacy appliances where you want to deploy this on high-end uh, hardware load balancers, well, two problems. One, you are stuck to uh, a very expensive solution. And two, the hardware solutions actually were optimized for RSA performance, not ECC performance. So today, the hardware load balancers actually punt their traffic to um, the control plane CPU, which is x86, and their performance on a very high-end, otherwise hundreds of thousand TPS solution, um, hardware solutions is, is one tenth or one twentieth of that. So the advantage of running in a software defined x86 environment is basically you get the cloud like flexibility and agility. You want more performance? Deploy a faster CPU, deploy more CPUs, horizontal scale, uh, programmatically, right? So, so not only we, on a, on a dollar for dollar basis, we have a higher performance, we can scale out to a much larger environment because of the horizontal scale, and you're future proofing yourself because as the Intel CPU improves, your performance improves. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ashish. That, um, wait one sec. We have one more question coming in. It is, um, why would you configure multiple interfaces on the, on the same SE? Um, yeah, would they, you would uh, uh, snap all connections and use uh, that for source IP info? So um, the reason you would have, good questions, uh, um, Dave. Uh, the reason you want to do that, if you want to have your service engine shared across multiple uh, networks or tenants. So for example, service engine is a load balancer. On that load balancer, you can have multiple VIPs. And, um, and multiple uh, VIPs might have pool members in different networks. So you want to make sure that you have an interface on the service engine that has a leg in each of the networks. That's the reason why you have multiple uh, interface on a service engine. If you're asking about why multiple IPs on an interface, why you need to allow to address pair, and that's because on the same interface, you want to have both the interface IP on which you're receiving actual traffic and communicating with, um, with the rest of the infrastructure, as well as the VIP or the virtual IP. That's the reason why you need more than one IP on a given interface. Um, again, uh, Dave, we can go into more detail offline, but uh, two reasons why you need multiple interfaces and multiple IPs on an interface. Okay, uh, we have a couple more minutes, so if you have other, other questions, so I'm happy to answer them. If not, um, you can reach out to me at ashish at avinetworks.com. Here is my contact information. Um, and otherwise, uh, thank you for uh, joining us at the uh, Best Practices for OpenStack webinar. For more information, again, go to avinetworks.com slash OpenStack.